So after the people had turned against God, began to worship the other gods of the land, in sin and rejection, God sent against them other nations, nations that oppressed them. As God's punishment for His people who had disobeyed Him, God brought in oppressors. These oppressors were from nations that worshipped other gods, and, and, and they came into the land and they would persecute God's people. For 330 years after Joshua, we have a continuing cycle of people, God's people, rejecting God, God bringing in oppressors to oppress them, the people repenting of their sin and turning back to God, calling out to God, and God raising up a deliverer to deliver them. And during the time that the deliverer, which we call a judge, was Amongst them, the people would continue to worship God. And then when that judge died, guess what? The cycle starts all over again. Sin, rejection of God, oppression, calling out to God, God delivering. Sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance. There are seven may or six major judges in the book of Judges, and there are six minor judges. Today I want us to look at Gideon, who is one of the major judges. Now Gideon was from the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh was the largest of the tribes. In fact, when the children of Israel went into the land to conquer the land, half of the tribe of Manasseh was on the west side of the river, Jordan, and half was on the east side of the river, Jordan. It was a large tribe. But in that large tribe, there was a little, small family. That family was the least of all of the people of Manasseh and all of the children of Israel. The Midianites had been oppressing the children of Israel for seven years as God's punishment for their sin. And, and the people cried out and God heard their cry. And He went to the smallest, weakest man in that tribe of Manasseh and his family, and I can't even begin to pronounce the family name, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it, but he went to this small individual, this weak individual. Now this man's name was Gideon. Gideon means mighty, mighty triumphant, or mighty warrior. Gideon's name. Gideon's father's name was jo uh, was uh, yeah Joash, and it was Joash, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. And the angel of the Lord goes to Gideon. Now Gideon, and as you read the story, the Midianites were large in number. They were they they. They, they were like the locusts. You couldn't count them. The number of camels they had, you couldn't count them. It was kind of like the sand. That's, that's, that's what the Bible says. So they, they, they were so numerous that nobody could count them. Okay. And they are oppressing the people. They are taking over the wheat. They're taking over the grain. They're taking over everything. Anything that the children of Israel harvest, the Midianites take. And then they also camp and destroy the land. And Gideon is one day down in a valley in a wine press. And he is threshing his grain. Normally when you thresh grain, you do it on a mountaintop or on a hilltop. So that as you thresh the grain, 
the wind blows the chaff away. But here's Gideon down in this little hole in this pit where they mash the wine, or they mash the grapes for the wine. And he's down there threshing his grain, trying to keep it hidden from the Midianites. And all of a sudden, a man shows up. How, Gideon! Oh, mighty warrior! Who are you talking to, man? I'm not a mighty warrior. I'm the least of my family. And the angel of the Lord speaks to him and says, I've got a job for you to do. You are going to be my deliverer. And I will be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, I don't think you understand. I am the, I'm, I'm the least of my family. I am not. A, I might have the name of a mighty warrior, but I am not a mighty warrior. I'm just a simple farmer down here trying to do my job. I'm trying to feed my family and keep the enemy from stealing my grain. You're my man. And Gideon says to the angel of the Lord, he says, wait here, sir. I want to go prepare you some food. I want a sign from you that you have really chosen me. And so the angel of the Lord says, I'll wait for you to go prepare your food. So, uh, so uh, Gideon goes in and he slain, slays a, a, a goat. He makes some unleavened bread. And he brings the meat, the bread, and the broth from the meat to give to the angel of the Lord so that he can eat. And the angel of the Lord says, okay, Gideon, you want to sign? And he doesn't really say this, but he says, okay, Gideon, take the meat and the bread and put it on this rock. Put it right there on this rock. And then I want you to pour the broth over the top of it. So Gideon does exactly what he's told. And the angel of the Lord takes his staff and he lays it and touches the rock with the end of his staff. And fire comes out of the rock and consumes the bread, the meat, and the broth from the rock. We're going to see that again a little bit later in the, in the story as as we look at Elijah and the prophets of Baal. <laughs> We're going to see that same kind of thing. But now Gideon has a sign. And he says, okay, I'll do what you told me to do. I've seen your sign. And the Lord says to Gideon, go out and gather your army. So Gideon sends out a message and he says, come, we're going to fight the Midianites. And 32,000 men show up. Now the estimated number of the enemy is over 200,000 armed men. Okay? That's the estimated number. That's a conservative number. Maybe it many more. But Gideon gets 32,000 men and they're going to fight 32,000. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, you got too many men. And Gideon says, Lord, wait a minute. I just want to make sure that, that, he, that you're in this, okay? And so Gideon says, I, I, I need another sign, God. I, I'm still a weak farmer. I'm not quite sure you, I'm a mighty warrior you think I am. So he says, Lord, I just want you to do this. I'm going to put this fleece out. And I want you to make the fleece wet tonight and all around, all around, around it dry. Sure enough, next morning. Gideon gets up, goes out, looks at the fleece, and the fleece is soaking wet. You ever try to pick up a wet lambskin? Ooh, heavy. It's hard to do. Anyway, he picks it up and he squeezes all the water out of it, and it's a bowl full of water. Now, I don't know how big the bowl was, but it was a bowl full of water. 
Yes. Okay, Lord, I know, I know that, that that's that's a good thing. Good thing, Lord. You you showed me that you're really with me. But Lord, I need another convincing argument. I'm still weak. I'm still scared. Still don't know what to do. I'm going to put the fleece back out tonight and I want you to make it dry, Lord, and, and all around and ground around and wet. Now, if you were God, and this puny little man down here who's so weak and so scared is, is talking to you and saying, Lord, give me another sign, what would you do? My inclination would be say, okay, I give up on you. It's not, you, you, you're worthless. That would be my inclination. But you know, God in His patience and His mercy and His love <clears throat> said, okay, Gideon. So God made it dry. Made the fleece dry and all around, ground around it. Gideon on the lower story looks at himself and he looks at the enemy out there and he says, I can't do anything. God says, I am with you. You can do anything I want you to do. God saw a bigger picture than what Gideon did. And so Gideon, after he has gathered his 32,000 soldiers, is ready to go out and fight and God whispers to Gideon and says, Gideon, you got too many men. You got too many men. Because if 32,000 go out, then you're going to claim that y'all were strong enough, you were as strong as God was, and our God is, and, and, and you're going to claim the victory. I want to have the victory. I want it to be recognized that it's me. So Gideon, you tell all of those 32,000 men, you, you give an announcement, if any of you are afraid, go home. Even the smallest little fear, go home. Now, I, if it was Gideon, if I was Gideon, I'd be leading that pack. I? <laughs> but it didn't work that way. But 22,000 men, go home. God says, Gideon, you still got twenty. You still got too many men. Even ten thousand men that you have left out of that thirty-two thousand. Even if you have ten thousand men, the, the children of Israel are going to claim credit for the victory. I will not get the credit. So I want you to to send the men down and have them drink. Go down to the water. Go down to the river and drink. So the men go down to the water and drink and some of them got on their hands and their knees and they put their mouths into the water and they drank and some of the men got down on, the, on their knees or one knee and one arm and scooped up water and drank it out of the palm of their hand. There were 300 of those men. God said, those are the men I want you to take into battle with. 200,000 men versus 300 men. If you're interested, that's 666 to 1 in a ratio. One man would have to fight 666 men and be victorious against them all. God says 300 men is going to defeat this army this mass in the valley of Jezreel. You know where the valley of Jezreel is? You ever heard of it before? If I said the valley of Armageddon, would you know what I was talking about? Okay, you, hear, you know that story. You know, you know what's going to happen there. But the valley of Jezreel is the valley of Armageddon. Same place. Same location. Been there forever. Or as long as the earth has been here or whatever. But anyway, there. God says, I want you to take your 300 men. I want you to 
to encircle the camp of the Midianites. And I want you to give to your men a torch and a jar. I want you to light the torches and I want you to put the jar over the top of the torches. Okay? Now what's going to happen when a torch is covered with a jar? It's going to tend to flame, it's going to tend to go down, but there's still going to be heat and stuff that's in there. The fire is still going to be there. And then I want you to take a trumpet in your right hand. So we got no swords, a trumpet, a torch, and a jar. And God says, when I give, or, and tells Gideon, when you give the command, when I tell you to, I want you to, have, to yell out and have your army yell out, for the Lord and for Gideon, and I want you to break the jar. And as soon as the jar is break, what happens? The torches flame back up. And when that happens, they blow their horn, the torches are there, they blow the horn, and the Midianites start fighting each other. <laughs> they start fighting each other. And they're killing each other. They're fighting. Gideon's not fighting at all. The soldiers aren't, at this point in time, aren't fighting. The Midianites are good. And, and the Midianites get scared and they start running down the valley to the Jordan River. And of course, then Joshua, or then uh, Gideon sends out word and all of the host of Israel comes out and they end up killing all of the Midianites. But God is the one who gets the credit for the battle. For the victory. You ever felt like you were weak, small? You ever felt like you couldn't do anything and God gives you a job to do? Gideon was kind of like the, the young man in, in, in high school or the young person in high school who whose picture was put in the high school album and I don't know whether it's still being done today, but in, in my time when you had the, uh, had the high school album, you had all of these different pictures of individuals, and the, 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 the person with the most charm, the most beauty, etc., etc., the one most likely to succeed, and then the one most likely to not succeed. Kind of be embarrassing. They probably do that today, I, I, I don't know, but at least it's being done on Facebook and all the talents that are given to individuals and other things. But have you ever been at a point where God gives you a, a task to do and you say, Lord, I can't do that. I'm the weakest of my family. We're the smallest church around. You know, we only have 14, 15 people in attendance over Sunday. Sometimes we get up higher. But we're small. And you know, we could be down in the dumps. We could say, well, nothing's ever going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that, that for the Home mission offering we gave over two hundred and sixty dollars. It's thirteen of us, fourteen of us. Uh, we got room to grow, and God's going to give us a task, and we can say, God, we can do what you want us to do. Okay, I don't know what I don't know what that task is. I, I wish I knew. I wish I could say to you, God has given me a message, and He He has given me something. This church is going to do this. I haven't got that message yet. Okay. But you know what? When we, not me, but when we get the message of what God wants us to do, we don't have to worry about success. We just have to worry about doing it God's way. And that God... <coughs> So as we look at our lives, as we look at the things that are happening to us, we can feel kind of weak and puny. 
We can feel like the whole world is against us and we will never succeed. But when God gives us a task, our responsibility is to walk where He leads. But there's another story here about Gideon. As we look at it, and as we look at uh, the story as it applies to our lives, as we look at the story of the children of Israel. <coughs> Scripture says in the book of Judges several times, and there arose another generation who knew not the Lord. You see, after Joshua and after Deborah and after uh, the other judges, even Solomon and, and Gideon, there arose after those judges died another generation. How many times have you got and I gone through the cycle that the children of Israel went through? How many times in, in the good times of life have we as individuals forgotten God? How many times have we then face trying times and difficulties in life and we did not know where to turn and the only way, the only place that we could turn to was to turn back to God. To repent of our going astray. To turn around and to go back to God. And have God to bless us. And have God to deal with our issues, to deal with the problems that we face because we have gotten away. How many times do we go through our lives in a cycle of sin, oppression, repentance, and deliverance? You see, God is ever faithful. God, for His people, recognizes that we will as people go astray. And that's not saying we need to deliberately do it. That's, that, that's a total another picture. But we do get into to things in life where we are faced with difficulties. And we cry out to God and God delivers us. It happens to individuals it happens to churches and it happens to nations. On November the 4th, there is an election. Okay? I don't know who to vote for. Okay? I really don't. I can't stand up here and say vote for this person or vote for that person. I cannot tell you who to vote for. That's not my job. My job is not to do that. My job is to say, look, you and I and our country, as citizens of our country, as Christians, need to be crying out to God for deliverance. We need to be crying out to God to, to find the men and the women that will be able to lead us, that will be able to set a standard in our country. Right now, we have no leadership. We have nobody that is really a leader that can amass people and get people to doing the right thing. We need a revival in our land. And we need to become, as Christians, serious about the issue of crying out to God for our nation. We need to be crying out to God for a revival in our nation. It has happened in the past. It can happen today. But you and I and other Christians in this world, in this country, 
need to be on our knees crying out to God for deliverance. Crying out to God to raise up a man or a woman of His choosing that can lead us in a return to Him and to His standards and to His principles. We're at a point in time in our lives that we need God in a special way active for us and for our nation. If you are monitoring or watching these sermons on cable or on the internet and you have gotten away from God I want to ask you to repent and to turn to God and to find a church of your choosing Maybe you've already been a member, but maybe you've backslidden and all. Find the church and go to it. And renew your faith and, and repent and let God restore you. For us here in our church, we need to seek God's guidance. We need to continue to pray and to seek renewal, to seek refreshment find out what God has for us to do. We're small. We're kind of like Gideon. We're small. But God has a plan. And it's our responsibility to find that plan and to carry it through. Let us pray. Father, I do lift up our church to you. I lift up to you First Southern of St. John. Lord, we're small. We're weak. And we seek your vision for us. We seek your direction in our lives as a church. We ask that you would show us what you want us to do in the midst of St. John and Stafford County and the state of Kansas and in the United States. Lord, give us a vision. Give us direction. And walk with us as we are obedient to you. For those, Lord, who do not know you, who have turned from you, we recognize that you are a gracious God, that you are a God who honors true repentance. And when we as individuals repent and turn to you that you are faithful and you will forgive. Father, for those who do not know you, who have never experienced you in their lives, we pray that they would come to recognize that you are truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That you are truly the only Resource, the only choice that a person can make in life that is going to be a lasting, eternal choice of good versus evil. Lord, and we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray for our country. As Christians, Lord, we look to you bring deliverance because we are going down the wrong path. We are going down the wrong road and as, as a nation that was once God-fearing, that was once a nation that many believed was a Christian nation, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you raise up for us the leadership that you would have that can return us to a path of right, that can return us to a path of honor, that can return us to a path of, of honesty. That can help us, Lord, to lead us under your guidance to be the nation and the people of God that you would have us to be in the coming days and weeks. Lord, it is so tempting just to rely upon your second coming 
It's of tempting, Lord, to try to, to, to do other things. But Lord, help us to focus on the fact of repentance and deliverance of a country from the over-oppressing, over-abundance of oppression from the satanic forces that surround us. Father, thank you for your love for us and thank you for the opportunity to come to worship. For it is in your precious Son's name I do pray.